So I'm going to start kind of in the beginning and just show a general overview of MR just really quick, and then I'll go into the items in the, the paragraph that Sabrina had sent and then run through some of the tips and tricks. So let me launch over to my computer, and I'm just going to close out of Management Reporter and relaunch it. So when you launch Management Reporter, it's going to use your Windows account, um, and it's automatically going to log in and... Um, prompt you with which company you would want to access. So those of you that have many different companies inside of Management Reporter, you can go up to the company window and then access your different companies from that list. Um, I like to just kind of start showing a general overview with the trial balance. So when you create reports in Management Reporter, you have to have two pieces um, that are called building blocks in order to save the report. One is called the row and one is called the column. So I'm going to start with the row format, which usually just contains the, the accounts inside of, uh, your, uh, inside of GP. So to do that, I'm going to go up to the upper left here and hit New Row Definition. And I'm just going to make a quick trial balance with all of the accounts inside of Great Plains and the Fabricam company. So I'm, I'm working down in the lower left here. You'll see that I've got GP open, and I'm logged into the Fabricam demo company. So to create a trial balance, um, rather than going in and just typing all of the accounts that I have in this link to financials dimensions, I am going to use a tool that allows me to add uh, ranges or chunks of accounts. So to get to that tool, I have to go to Edit and then Insert Rows from Dimensions. And inside here, you're going to see uh, a list that mimics your account framework inside of Great Plains. So in Fabricam, I have a division an account, a department, and then the account categories that are assigned to each account. Every one of these segments can be used to report against inside Management Reporter. Now keep in mind, Management Reporter will only pull data from the general ledger. So if you're looking to run sales reports or, or purchasing reports, you're going to want to use a different tool for that. Over here along the right side, you'll see four additional columns. Um, these are the user-defined fields that are also on, on the accounts inside of Great Plains. So those are these right here. User-defined 1, 2, 3, and 4. Those can also be used to report against. Okay, so I'm going to insert all of my accounts. Um, if I wanted to do a range, I could start typing in a range of accounts here. So if you're going to start creating an income statement or a balance sheet, um, and if you wanted to say, let's, for example, get all your assets in in one chunk, you could just go 1,000 to 1,999 and click OK. But in this case, I'm going to insert all of my accounts, so I'm not going to restrict it at all here. I'm just going to click OK. And automatically, my all the accounts in GP are going to be populated into my row format. Um, with a trial balance, we, we don't want the normal balance on there, so any account that's a revenue, income, equity, or liability account, which is a normal credit balance, we don't want to use that inside of the trial balance, no, um, where we would inside of the balance sheet or income statement. So I'm going to get rid of all those Cs there for the normal credit balance accounts. I'm just going to highlight that column and hit delete. And then I'm going to get rid of all of these extra lines at the bottom. Because if you don't get rid of these, um, and your page happens to be printing down to the bottom of the report, you'll notice that it'll, when you print it, it will print on an extra page or two, depending on how many of these extra lines you have. So it's important to get rid of any excess space at the bottom. So to do that, I'm going to highlight the whole left. I can just left click and drag down, or I could use the shift key and highlight. Right click, and I'm going to delete those rows. And at this point, I am going to hit Save, and I'm just going to call it the Webinar Trial Balance. And then I'll click OK. So um, building block one of two that are necessary to save a report or create a report in Management Reporter is ready. The next one is the column layout. So I'm going to close my row. I'm going to get back to a blank slate here. And in the upper left, I'm going to go up and do New column definition. The column definition inside of a management reporter report is usually kind of the time frame of the report or the type of data. So in this case, it's a trial balance. So I'm going to pull um, current month information, or what you would call in GP is the net change, and then a year-to-date column. 
So in a column layout, it also is like a report definition where it has two requirements before you can save it. It has to be a description column. So if I double click in the column type cell, you can see the option to choose description. And then there also has to be a financial dimension column. Now, financial dimension is related into GP, um, each of your different segments it's, it's talking about. So I'm going to choose financial dimension, and we're going to use a periodic column. And you'll notice by default, it always puts periodic as the periods covered. So now if I double click under the periods covered, I can choose year to date. And here now I have the, the two required columns inside of a column layout um, that are necessary in order to save the column. And then I also added one additional financial dimension column to grab my year to date information. And up at the top, I'm going to add some headers. Um, I'm just going to double click inside of the header two cell. And what we have that makes reporting dynamic uh, with your headers is this header text, insert auto text. If I click the drop down, I can choose the, the name of the month, or I can just hand type. So this here is a year to date column. I'm just gonna uh, freeform type in there called year to date. And in this case, I'm ready to save my column layout. So again, the two building blocks required for a report are the row and the column. The two columns in the side of a column layout required to save it are the description column and the financial dimension column. Uh, we'll call this column webinar, and I'm going to click OK. So my two building blocks are ready. Now I'm going to link the two building blocks inside of a report definition. Um, if I go up to the top, click New, Report Definition. Now I need to assign my building blocks. You'll notice right down here are the, uh, is the section in the report definition to the assign the building blocks. If I click the drop down, you're going to see all of the different rows that are available inside of my instance of Management Reporter. And I need to find my trial balance for the webinar. Uh, where did I put that? Right here. Webinar trial balance. And in the column layout, I had column trial, column webinar. And most of the data inside the Fabricam company that I have is in 2017. So this default base period, uh, you'll notice in here it says S minus 1. Well, what that means is if I go down to the bottom right and if I look at the date on my computer, it says May 1st. So S minus 1 means take the system date of your computer and subtract one month. So you'll notice that it's going back to April of 2018. Well, I know that my data is, is kind of old in my demo company, so I need to go back 13 months to get back to April of 2017. So I'm going to hit S minus 13 there. And if I save this, I'm going to give it a, a name. This setting here, the default base period, will save with the report. But you also have the option to go in and change where you, what dates you want to run the report for in the left here the base period drop down or the base year drop down. By changing this, you'll notice over here on the right that the date does change. So here is 630. But this default base period will always stay the same, stay the same with the report. So changing the date here is never going to save. Um, just keep that in mind. Um, and these base periods are what also work in making the reports dynamic. And those get plugged into the column layout. So if I go back to that column layout, if you remember, we created a description column. So that's going to grab the description of the accounts from our row format, along with two financial dimension columns. One was, a, one was just a periodic column, which will grab the net change amounts from Great Plains. And then a year-to-date column, which is going to grab the year-to-date information, along with those beginning balance amounts for any accounts um, that are set up as a balance sheet account inside of Great Plains. Um, and I'm going to run the report for April of 2017. So when I run the report, those months and years get plugged into these base periods and base years here. So period four would get plugged in here, and period and year 2017 would get plugged in here. Now you don't want to hard code information here because that removes the flexibility of these management reporter reports and in, in the ability to have dynamic dates. So we want to leave these at base and base. So the purpose of that was just to kind of show you how Management Reporter works when you're plugging in the dates. So let me put that back the way it was, and I'm going to go back. And I'm just going to make a couple of changes that I know 
um, are helpful in running a trial balance report. So a lot of times you'll have accounts that may or may not have balances, and I don't want to show any of those accounts with balances in my report, or I don't want to show accounts with that are zero balances in my report. So I'm going to click up here in the Report Definition Settings tab, and I'm going to uncheck this box to display rows with no amounts. And then I'm going to go back to the Report tab, and this detail level is also very important. So with with any report, you can choose how much detail you want management reported to run in the background. In this case, a financial is just going to grab just the top summary level of, of the accounts. If I choose financial and account, it's going to grab um, the summary level of that account, plus you're going to be able to drill in. And for example, if you have multiple cash accounts that are for a, that um, are used across departments, so if I had a uh, cash account in my accounting department or cash account inside of uh, HR department or something like that. You may have, uh, you may want the ability to drill down and see those separated. So this is going to allow me to get to that, to, to that level, excuse me, or I can go all the way down to the transaction level. That's going to allow me the ability to drill down all the way to see the actual transaction that makes up the balance of those accounts. And also the provisional level, you have the ability to pull posted detail or unposted activity inside of uh, Great Plains. For this, I'm going to leave it at posted activity only, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit save again, and I'm going to hit generate. So what happens now is your management reporter client tells the server, I want this report with these dates, go ahead, process it, and when you're done, send it back to me so that I can see what it looks like. Um, you'll notice now it's processing. Down on the bottom there, the rounding is always the last step. So that little window that you saw pop up there, that is called the, um, the report queue status. So it kind of just gives you a list of all of the different reports that have been, been generated and the status of those reports. Now if you ever see uh, something like this along the left side, that means that uh, something happened with the report and you need to take a, take a peek at me, maybe see if it's anything worth worrying about. If there's a big old red exclamation point over here, that means that there's something wrong with the report and you're going to need to go in and fix it before it's actually going to generate properly. So let's go back and look at our trial balance. You can see here it ran. I don't have any blank spaces in here, so I know that it excluded all of my accounts with zero balances. Um, but now I, I don't quite know if I if everything is balancing correctly. So we're going to go in and we're going to add a check balance. And this is one of the items that was on uh, on the report. So we're going to do uh, a check row here just to make sure that our trial balance uh, evaluate or balances to zero on both of the the month to date information and the year to date information. And then later in the, the webinar, we're going to look at the income statement and do a check balance for uh, the net income on when we when we get to that point. So let's go back and add a line in here to make sure that all of these values evaluate to zero. So let's close report viewer. I'm going to go back into my row format. There's some handy little icons right beside each of the different building blocks to get to those. Uh, faster than going to search for them along the left side here in the navigation pane. So I'm going to open my row. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom of the report, and I'm going to add a couple of rows. To do that, I'm going to click the down arrow key on my keyboard. I'm going to add, uh, I'll just add three, three lines. And here, I'm going to add a format code. I'm going to double click in the format col code column, and I'm going to underscore. I'm just going to type uh, check balance. And I need to add up all of the lines inside the report. So to do that, Management Reporter uses the row code along the left here. Each of these are individually assigned numbers to the lines to identify kind of like a, a row. So I know that my bottom row is 9910, and all of the row formats start with row code 100. So I'm going to use these row codes in my calculation to get my total. 
I'm going to use a total. So if I double click in format code, I'm going to choose total and I'm going to go 100 colon to 9940. Now I did, I did lie there. I said I'm going to use 9910, but I like to use 99, the line right below it. Um, as long as there's some sort of format code on there. Uh, in this case, it's not the best example because you can't really add a, an account higher than 9999. But why I like to use this is just in case you do have an account after this, it's always going to be included in the total. And then on the last line, I'm going to underscore the amounts. So there I should have a check balance. Um, if I hit save, I can close my row. And if I generate again, Hopefully those show um, no amounts in them. That means that my debits and credits all matched um, and I don't have anything that I need to worry about inside the report. All right, so there we've got uh, zero balances down there so I know that my report is good here. Any, any questions on that? That was just a quick rundown for those that may be pretty new to Management Reporter. Um, the rows, the columns are the two required pieces for a report, and then you need to tie them together again in a report definition. Any, any questions that, that are out there, Sabrina? Uh, this is Sabrina. Yeah, I have everyone muted, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in that uh, little conversation box on the left-hand side. I don't see okay. any questions right now, but if, you, um, if anybody asks one, I'll feel free to pass those along. All right. Okay, so I'm going to go now into the distribution section, um, which was part of the piece that Sabrina wanted me to cover in the webinar, webinar. Up on the top here, if I click on my report definition, under output and distribution, you have quite a few different options for um, getting the report out to the different people in your organization. Um, by default, Management Reporter will generate every report you run into the Management Reporter database, and that also is kind of called the library. So if you look here, every report has to go to the library, and it's just so that all the reports can get stored. You can also choose to generate to multiple report library locations. So when you install Management Reporter, it, it really does install two pieces. And you find a lot of people will go down here and they'll start typing and they'll search for Management Reporter. Well, then nothing, nothing is ever going to show up because the two pieces are for some reason named differently. So they're called Report Designer and then Report Viewer. Report Designer is where you go in and you generate, create, and edit all of the reports. Viewer is just available there for you to look at them. Um, down here on my tray, you'll see that I have Report Designer um, pinned and Viewer. So if I open the Viewer, along the left here, this is the library it's talking about. So when you're inside of Report Designer and looking to choose a library location, it's asking you for a location here. Now, in the library, you can create multiple folders. So if I wanted to create another folder in here, say, for example, called Income Statements, I could do that, and then I could choose in all my income statement reports that this is the folder that I would want them to generate to. So let's just go back over to Report Designer now, and if I click Select, you can see it mimics the picture inside of my, uh, my library. Now also, uh, outside of just being able to generate to a library, you can choose to generate to a location out on the network, which I'm going to do um, here. I'm going to click Add. Actually, I'll click Browse. And you need to use a UNC shared path. So I have a, a path on my computer called just, just temp. So if I go to Cori-PC and hit Enter, there's my temp folder. That's a shared folder. And if I hit Select, now this report is going to go to the library and also this temp folder. So the reason why you would want to do this is Let's say, for example, you have those individuals that you don't really want inside of Management Reporter because all they're going to do is they're going to mess up your reports. Um, so you want them to just be able to, to go out and look at the report once it's generated. So that would be an example where you would just give them rights inside of security, which we'll go into here next to show you how to restrict different levels of reports. Um, you would give them access to just um, either Management Reporter viewer Sorry, 
you're not you're going to give them access inside security here as just kind of like a, a viewer. So in this case, I've got a couple of different test accounts in here. Um, I would make them just a viewer access only. So that way, if they go out and double click on a report or try to get into a report designer, they're not going to be able to get into this um, this piece of the client install to go in and, and edit any of the reports. They're only going to be able to open the generated reports. Um, and out on the network, what it would look like, we'll just kind of show you that here now. So I'm going to regenerate the report after I've added this temp folder. If I hit generate. So one other piece here is I, I know a couple of customers have SharePoint. So you can add links to SharePoint and SharePoint folders in here as well so that it will generate directly into uh, different folders that you've created in SharePoint. So you have a finance folder out there. You can add that link, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash and then your SharePoint site along with the folder and it's going to automatically generate out there for folks to go out and review. So then you're going to have a couple levels of security. They're going to need access to SharePoint plus they're going to need access to the MR report. Okay, let's go look for that temp folder. So here it is right here, uh, trial balance webinar. If I double click it, you'll notice that it's going to open in my in a web viewer and I'm going to it, it went to my default. So I'm going to flip over here to Internet Explorer. Uh, let's go to Edge here and see if it opens. I just needed to make that site trusted inside of Google Chrome. It's not running here either. Let's try this one. Okay, so here's what, what someone that didn't have access to the client would see or didn't have a client installed on their computer. They're going to get the web viewer access. So they would browse out to their temp folder or their finance folder, um, wherever you des designed to store the reports for them. They double click it and it's going to open in a web viewer. The web viewer has the exact same functionality as the regular viewer where you're going to be able to come out here and you're going to be able to drill into your different accounts. So here in this case we just have one cash operating account but I can drill all the way down to the transaction level and see the underlying transactions that make up that balance. All right, so now how do I restrict access to people um, to the individuals um, when you're using a report tree. Um, so the tree is kind of the the piece that is not it's it's not kind of it's not necessary to run a report. So if I click the tree type drop down, you'll see the option to choose different reporting trees. Well, instead of using the trial balance for this, now I'm going to flip over um, to using uh, an income or kind of a quarterly statement. Um, which is called this rolling, sorry, it's this expenses three-year quarterly trend that I'm going to use now. I'm going to hit no to save that. And let's just uh, look at the last time that I had generated this report. So if I want to do that, I know that I generated this report just before the webinar to kind of see what was going on with it. So there's an icon right, right to the left of the generate icon that I can click um, that will allow me to open the last time I had run the report. And you can see along the left here that I had used a tree. Um, and I can tell that because I have the option here to click between different departments. So I've got my accounting division, my administration division, and my sales division. Well, I want to restrict access to who can see the accounting division or the admin division and the sales division. And to do that, you have to use a tree. Um, and in this case, I had removed the tree because I wanted to show you a couple other uh, tips before going in and assigning uh, security to the report tree. So I'm going to generate it one more time to get it generated back without the tree and kind of show you some formatting items that are useful. Um, as you can see, this report doesn't fit on one page. So I'm, in order to do that, I'm going to show you the settings that will allow me to go in and do that. So I'm going to close my report. I'm going to go up to the settings tab on the report. 
And it's kind of the, the hidden little button down here that the people really aren't aware of this button that says other. If you click that other button, you have the option to change it from portrait or landscape. And then there's this shrink page to width. If I click this radio button, it's going to make sure that however uh, many columns you have in your report or however long it is, it's going to fit on the one page. Now that's, I, I shouldn't say long because if your, your accounts stretch to multiple pages, it's, it's not going to make those fit on the same page, but it will for as far as the width goes. So now if I click OK, and if we rerun it, you'll notice that my page or my report should fit on the one page. There, so now I've, I'm, I'm stuck on just one page, which makes it look a lot nicer. Um, a couple of things that people don't normally use with Management Reporter, and, and they kind of really, it needs the right circumstance in order for it to work, um, are, the, uh, are charts. So you have the ability to choose a chart on a line. So if I right click on this salaries item, and if I choose select row, you'll notice up here on top, oh, does someone have a question? Oh, okay, so you'll notice on the top that these icons will be high, or available now. You know, if I don't have the row selected, they're just um, blank. But now I can add a column graph and column chart in here, and then I can pin it over to my report. Now, no, it does not look very nice here, but when you're using the web viewer, for those people that may not have access to get into the designer or the actual um, regular viewer, you're going to see a pretty nice looking chart in there. So let's go out and look at that. Um, if I choose this copy link icon, I should be able to grab the link that's embedded inside the report. I'll go back to Internet Explorer, which I appear to have closed. I'm going to copy that link in, and I'll type in my username and password again. All right, so now we have the same report. It looks exactly the same here. Um, but now if I choose show uh, charts, I can get a nice layout of that chart. So that's that 4,000 sales account for my different quarters. Um, just kind of listed and, and it looks a lot nicer inside of the web viewer than it does with the client. And uh, this is one of the major reasons why they did create the web client is because it, it has the ability to use a lot more of your screen and, and it looks nicer with the charts and graphs. I'll just minimize that now. Okay, so now oh, what else I was going to show here? Okay, the ability to switch between the web viewer and the regular client viewer. Now this is kind of hidden too where people don't know that there are options like this. Um, and you get a lot of support calls saying, uh, so when someone gets a new computer and then you install the client, well by default, it automatically always installs as the web viewer. But people like it back the old way. So to do that, you have to click Tools and then Options. And then down here is this checkbox. I'm kind of partial to using the the regular viewer, so I always open it and I come down and check this box. So keep that in mind when you do a new client install that you're going to need to check this box in order to get it to use the default viewer. Another option that I'd like to show here is this at startup. You can tell it to do something. So if you always want it to open the last report that you were using, if you click the drop down, you have a couple of options. Um, you can show, show an empty environment, which I have set. Um, you can show the uh, the last loaded report, which I think is kind of neat. So if you close out or leave for the day and come back the next day, you want to get back and start where you're at, it's going to automatically load the last report that you had open. And then also on the bottom, um, I think we have a lot of folks that will take these reports and they'll generate them out to Excel. Well, you can choose to show the headers inside of a print layout inside of Excel, which I, I really don't like, but I like to have it shown um, in the normal view. So that way, all of the headers and the footers inside the report are going to open in Excel, uh, 
um, so that you can see them nicely. So if you flip back and forth, oh, let me just show you an example here. So here's a, a little screenshot of what it would look like. So if this is the normal view on the top up here in this section, all of the headers are displayed nicely inside of their own cell. But down at the bottom, you can kind of see they don't look, it doesn't look real nice. Um, the, the bottom unit description is going in inside of the report. So it's a little nicer to embed it and use the normal view, and you'll get a nicer looking report when you export it to Excel. And again, that, section, that setting is just under tools and then options, and then you have all of these different pieces in here. So just remember, at startup, how to change the default viewer, and then use the normal view for Excel. Okay, where am I at? Fit with. I'm going to go through and make sure I'm covering everything here that I have in the list. Chart, web viewer, headers, last report. Okay. Um, kind of another tip on this one. You may be wondering how I was able to separate that report into quarters and years. Well, all of that was done, if you remember up front where we talked about the column layout. Well, that's kind of the time frame that you want to pull the data for. So I know that I need to go look in my column, and it's a three-year quarterly trend. If I pop that open, what we did is we took, um, you can see that we have the four, four periods per year, or four quarters per year. Um, initially, the first year, of course, when we run it for 2017, that's going to be your base year. And then we're going to subtract a year for two years. So we're going to go to base minus one to get to 2016. Um, to do that, you'll notice that the option in here, you'll see base, minus, and then it has a pound symbol indicating that if you choose that, well, you need to type something in for that pound symbol. And to do that, you can hit F2 to get into the cell, and I just change it to a one. And then I also go back to 2015 over here. So it says base year. When I run the report for 2017, it's going to subtract two additional years over here. And then down in the period covered section, or period section, sorry, each of these different has the period range. So I got periods 1 through 3, 4 through 6, 7 through 9, and 10 through 12. And then to get those over to the next set of columns, all you have to do is you can just copy, and then you can paste them in, just like you would with Excel. Okay, so now let's get back to the security part. I need to add that division tree back on. So if I click the drop down for tree types, choose reporting tree, I'm going to add my division. And now if I want to restrict this report to specific people, I'm going to go out to my division tree. And then if you scroll over to the right, you're going to see something that call, is called unit security. So in order to enable unit security, all you have to do is put a user on one line. If I hit users and groups, I'm going to add this administrator user here so that when this user pops this report open, they're only going to be able to see this unit of the tree. Now, notice that I don't have any other users in here. Um, if I run this report at the... Uh, in this manner, no users in this case are going to be able to see these lines. So I'm going to add my Cori account into the rest of these. I don't know if you can copy and paste this, but I'm going to try it. Yes, I can. So I was able to paste my user into those other cells. So I'm going to hit Save. I'm going to close it. And I'm going to hit Generate. So this comes in handy for those that may not want people to see the values um, from it within other departments. So if you've got uh, a manager in charge of each of those different divisions, you can go in and you can add that manager um, into those divisions so that they can only see what they're responsible for. Um, so you'll notice here, my, my user, Corey, is an administrator in this entire uh, inside of Management Reporter, but still, it restricts me from seeing this. It just says, this report display, or this report view can't be displayed due to unit security. Um, so, I mean, it's doing what it's supposed to. Um, if I come down to Administration, yep, I had access to that one. If I click on Sales, well, yep, that one works for me too. Uh, and so does the Summary, because that's exactly how I had assigned security. 
Now, if I launched this report as the admin user, I would only see, um, which I think I chose accounting for that person for some reason, um, but they would only be able to see this unit of the tree. So I can show you what that would look like in the web viewer. Um, I, you notice that I did not choose to generate it to a library location, so I'm going to go out and add that here too. And it defaulted in to the last spot that I had. I'm going to select the folder, and I'm going to hit Save. And then if I just generate it again, choose all my units, and if I browse out here, we should see another report come in here once it's ready. Queuing, processing, um, it says that it's rounding. Rounding is always the last step. Um, you can see there's my report. Uh, let's double click it and I'll just show you in Chrome here. All right, so then down in the lower left, uh, shoot, I, I uh, launched it as my user again. But I could launch it as administrator, and then I would see just accounting. So to do that, if I shift right click and choose, oh, I can't do that. That's different user. So I'm going to launch Google Chrome uh, here as the administrator account. But then if I go here, I'm going to grab the path of the report. I'm going to pop it into this user running it. And we should just see the accounting department. If I click on reporting tree, you can see that only accounting is available for me to select. So pretty, pretty handy. You can do a lot of neat things with security and um, letting people see their different sections of the report. So any, any questions up to this point? I haven't seen anything come in yet, Corey, but people Nothing? can feel free to ask questions, yeah? Oh, yep. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to ask away. Um, we've only got well, it's about 20 minutes left here, so let me go over to the income statement, and I'm going to just kind of show you that check balance that I've created over there on that. Of course, I didn't put it in the section up here that I wanted to, um, so I'm going to have to go looking for it over here in the navigation pane. But another nice thing about the um, when you're in Report Designer is you have the option to add one level of folders over here um, so that I could have created um, a folder called Webinar Reports, and I could have put them all in there, or I could have created one... Um, you can create folders called income statements, balance sheets, and so forth. Um, the nice thing about the viewer, though, is you can add multi-levels. So I could have a default report definitions, plus then um, a listing of income statements and all ordered nicely in here. But where I did that check balance is I did that on this income statement. So if I double-click this one, I should also say these default report definitions, um, they're not always there by default, but if you want to go in and add them in to, to use them, they have a lot of great examples. And in, uh, I used, I started with all of these for all of these reports, or for all of the reports that I used in the webinar. Um, to add those, if you just go to Tools, and then there's uh, Import Default Reports. Um, this was added oh, somewhere in the middle of the road where, um, like, Critical Update, eight or nine, something like that, um, where the, the project managers at Microsoft added all of these different reports. So they have a lot of good examples. Uh, I would recommend using them um, if you have a lot of questions uh, on how to do some more of the complex column layouts or row formats. Okay, back to the check balance. So the check balance for my income statement. If I go into my row format, and I'm going to scroll down to the bottom, and you'll notice down here I've added a couple of lines. So uh, I know that my uh, net income, uh, to get my, the net income of my accounts, I would run from account range 4,000 to 9,999. Um, so what I did here is I grabbed that row and I did a non-print on it. So this line is never going to show up in the report. But then I also took, um, on row code 1180, I did a net income check line. I put it in red. Um, my total is 910, so row code 910, 
which is my net, net operating income line. Oops, I should have used 1030. Uh, 1030. So sorry, I used 1030. So it's going to take my net income here, which goes through all of my revenues and expenses to get the net income. Um, and then I'm going to subtract it against this check balance that I have that I know is always going to give me the correct net income. So if, if this line ever shows up here, I know I have a problem in my report. So let's just check it out. Um, again, these are the demo reports. Uh, it's possible that the data may not quite line up. But um, I'm guessing that we will for sure see the line show up. So I'm going to go to S-13 and run it for uh, April of 2017. I'm going to generate, and it's going to tell the server that I want the report for April and display it when you're done. Okay, so here I can see that my net income uh, check uh, has a problem. So I would need to go in then and figure out what, what I did wrong uh, in my report. Well, there's a pretty cool tool called... Um, Missing account analysis. Now, in this case, I've got the account categories in the row, so I don't know if it's quite going to help in this scenario. But if I go up, we'll check it out. So tools and then missing account analysis. And what you'll see it do is it's going to take all of the building blocks inside the uh, inside of my setup, and I know I'm working with this summary income statement default. So I'm going to click on that here. And down on the bottom, it's going to tell me, uh, what I'm missing. So it says that I have all of these different account categories that are missing, which is where I would start in this case. But if I had, if I was using just the main account segment in the row, then it's going to give me a list of all the main accounts here. So I would start by using this. Um, I know that I'm missing <laughs> whatever the sinking fund payable category is or short term investments category. All of these are missing. Um, now, a lot of these are probably balance sheet ones, too. Um, but I would go through here. I would look for any of them that may be tied to my income statement. And then I would go back to my row. And then I would add those in here into their necessary locations. And then I'd run the report again. Um, and then I'd check, my, uh, check to see what it takes to get rid of that uh, check balance line. OK, any questions on that? Okay, so that leads me into uh, another item on the, the list was checking, uh, sorry, um, the dimension value sets. So I'm going to use my net income line. So working with Management Reporter, I've seen a lot of uh, accounts structures where not all of the accounts are lined up nicely like this one, where, say, for example, the revenue or something, maybe in the threes, and then you've got another revenue account that may be in the fours. Well, it gets pretty hard to just use a range in that case. So it's recommended to use a dimension value set. So where I would come in here, and if I double click on this account, um, there's this option to use a dimension value set. So I'm going to click that radio button. And if I choose manage dimension value sets, I'm going to click new. And I'm going to make one called net income. And I'm going to go from 4,000 to 9,999. So those, for example, if, if your net income account range may not be able to go from 4,000 to 9,999, you can come in here and you can just do something like, say, 4,000 to uh, 4,999. And then maybe it's, um, let's go, maybe it's 6,000, 6,999. So you could do that. Oops, too many nines. And we'll just get rid of this just to kind of show the example. So now I have a dimension value set called net income. And rather than using my range down here or typing in all of the accounts manually each time you wanted to do this in a report, you can come in here now and just choose to use uh, your set of net income. So it makes it a lot easier to add lines into your row format or if you're using them in the column layout. Um, it takes away a lot of the, the setup. So had you tried to do this without a dimension set, you would come in here and you would add uh, 
the account multiple times, and then I did 6,000 to 69999, like so. And you'd have to do that every time you, you created a row format for, uh, for a report. So it's a lot easier to just use that dimension value set. Okay, that covers. So now we had um, some report groups. Um, the nice thing about a report group is that you can um, bundle your reports and you can then click generate once and it's going to generate a, a bunch of reports all at the same time. So let's just go a new, sorry, up in the top left, I'm going to click new on a report group and I'm going to click add and let's just add these top two. So now I have a 12 month rolling income statement and then a trend, trended income statement. I've stuck them both in one report group. If I click save, I would just call it like income statements. I'm gonna click okay. And now I can choose the drop down here where I would, would um, pick the date. And if I hit generate, it's going to run both of these reports at the same time for the same date. Now taking it one step further, I have the ability to schedule this report group. So if I go down to the navigation pane in the lower left, I can click on report schedules. I can click new. I'm going to have the ability to schedule an individual report or a group. I'm going to change it to group, choose income statements. And let's say I wanted to run this monthly. Um, on the first day of the month, actually, you know, let's give the accountants a little time to make sure everything balances. So let's, uh, let's make it the seventh day of the month. Um, and I'm not going to put an end date. So if I save that, report schedule, this schedule is going to run itself on the seventh day of every month um, and be out there and available in the output and distribution tab so you can change that here. So it's going to generate those reports on the seventh day of every month and put them in the locations that you tell it. So it kind of takes the, the work out of going through and doing your monthly reports. Once you have them set, you can just go in and schedule them and they're ready to go. Any, any questions on any of that? Nope. Okay. So we're getting getting down to the end here. There's a couple pieces that I had left. I'll make sure. Let me make sure I got everything on the list. Um, yeah, it looks like it. Okay. So I created this report here, um, this rolling quarter income statement with the forecast. So I'm just going to show you what this looks like. So this is usually a pretty cool tool called um, conditional formatting. So if I open it, it might be kind of hard to see, but what I have inside the report um, is a set of col as a column set that has actuals and budgets. And but what I want it to do is if I run the period run it for period four, I only want to show my four periods of actuals, and then the rest of the periods show the budget amount from Great Plains. So to do that, I have a conditional formatting in the column layout. So I'm going to go back to report designer and I'm going to open the column layout. I called it forecast. So you'll notice that inside of the column layout, I've got 24 different columns plus one as a total. But the conditional formatting here allows it to show or determine which column should show. So each one has an actual column for January. Uh, for each month, I have an actual and a budget. So I've hard coded the period. And then I have the actual, and then if you double click here, for those of you that do use budgets in Great Plains, you'll see those available inside of this book code and attribute category. But the, the, the neat thing about it is, is down here on this print control. If you double click in there, you have this conditional print option, which is kind of hidden. People really don't know it's there, but it, it has the option to choose whether or not to show um, based on the dates you have in the column and what you run the report for. So I ran this for period four, but it's going to check here. So is one less than or equal to four? And yes. So that one's going to show. Over in the next one, is one greater than four? No. So this one's not going to show. But I'm going to get all the way over to period five before that's going to become true. 
So is 5 greater than 4? Yep. So that one's going to start showing. So from this point forward, I'm going to get my budget columns. And then to the left, it's going to show me all of the actual information. So just to show you, if I choose period 6, I should get June up to June. Oops, I had it at 2018. I'm sorry. I need to flip this back. Save, and then I'll rerun it. So you'll notice here now that my report queue is going to have two of them. Uh, the first one that's going to show up, it ran for um, some bad data. So I'm going to close that out. And then we'll let it finish here for 17. Uh, looks like it says it's done. So I, I probably accidentally closed them both. Oh, here it is. So you can see here now I have actual data for up to June. And then my budget takes over on the right. So then I can kind of see where I'm tracking. And of course, these budgets are, are pretty far off, but in this case, I'd say it's a, it's a lot better than, than what we had in there. <laughs> um, next, next thing, how do I get this to stretch across? How do I get the actual to actually conform with, with my actual selection and my budget with my budget selection? Well, you can stretch your headers inside of the column layout across um, by using these dates. So if I double click on my actual cell, and I'm going to drag it down over to the left here, um, I have a spread from column B over to base. So the base means the date on the report. The same thing it uses to evaluate whether or not the, the conditional format is true to display the column or not. So it's going to spread from column B to the base period, which I chose June. So it's going to spread those six months. And the budget is a little bit different where it's going to take the base minus one. So it's going to say, okay, he said to run it for June, or base plus one. I'm going to go start one month after that, and I'm going to run from period, uh-oh. It sounds like someone may have put us on their hold music. Oh, so, okay, there it's gone. Okay, so then it's going to spread to column Y. If I scroll all the way to the right, that's the end. So that's where my budget is going to stop. And then the last fancy thing on this one is you'll notice that I'm doing a year-to-date total with a range. If I had done B plus C plus D plus E, well, it's going to add up all of those columns, whether they display here based on the print, print control or not. The nice thing about using a range over here is if the column doesn't show up, it's not included with the calculation. So those are all the, the three kind of tips and tricks to get those spreads to work on the headers, how to show, uh, tell the budget or actual to show, plus to make sure that the year-to-date column is correct. Um, and then so I'm going to open it up to questions now if anybody has any specific questions. And if not, there was one piece that I wanted to show um, with attributes, which are, are pretty <laughs> uncommonly used. I'm going through and unmuting everyone who is um, on the call. So if you have questions, you can ask. If you're on the phone, you'll just have to hit um, star to unmute yourself. OK. So feel free to just um, butt in and, and ask questions. But I'm going to just kind of go, go and show you this attribute. So every time you do a transaction in the general ledger, or if you start from um, the payables or receivables, there are items that are tied to that transaction that get pushed into the general ledger. Um, just to kind of show you how that works is if I go into the column layout, uh, I have one here with just a period periodic column. And then there's this option for a column type of attribute. And then if I double click on the book code or attribute category, you'll see all of these pieces that are tied to the transactions when you send them to the general ledger or do a GL transaction. Um, the ones that I like to use a lot are these originating master record ID or the names. Those are the vendor and customer IDs and names. But to just show you what the report looks like, um, if I open the last time I had run it, and I'm going to drill into one of the accounts. So all of those are tied to the actual transaction level. So you have to have a periodic column in order for this to work. But if I just choose, uh, let's go down to salary expense. Oops, I didn't have it generated for a transaction. We'll, we'll just run it again here and get it to pull, to pull up. Okay. 
Let's and I'm going to drill all. Let's just go to this tax expense. We're going to go all the way down to the transaction level, and you'll see I got all this gobbledygook in there that's pretty hard to see. But if I expand it, you'll notice all of these different pieces have information tied to them. So here's my transaction description. Here's the audit trail code. Well, they must post payroll here in detail because uh, here's each of the different employee IDs. So I I could restrict this down uh, and make like I could I could separate out the taxes per person in an MR report if I needed. But um, so this was just kind of to show you the 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 attributes that are assigned with the report. Well, I can I'll take it one step further and I'll go back. Let's not let me close it here. I'm going to go back over here. I created a report called um, Sales with Attributes. Did I hide it? Oh, here it is, Sales by Customer. So what I did is I took a column, and I, I grabbed my attribute category of originating master record ID, which is my um, customer ID. And then down here, I can filter out the data. So I took my different customers, and then I filtered them here so that I'm going to get sales by customer going across for these six different customers. And if I, sh um, and in my row format, I only have my sales, my sales accounts. So then if I show you, uh, I'll show you what that looks like. If I run the report, I'm going to get a list of the sales by customer. So uh, Metro had 1900 and uh, they purchased 1,900 and items. Baker's was 3,500, and, and the big one was Aaron Fitz at 6,200. And that's all used by the attribute category. So as long as you run the report for the transaction level, you're going to get that detail on the report, and MR can use that detail um, to show you the information. Um, and to kind of just show you where that is in the table, all of these these columns inside of the GL 20,000 table, like here's a list of all of the different customers or vendors that are used. So as long as that's there, you can use it in your report. Um, and it would be there because you, you don't tell it not to, to track it. So, Well, that's an hour already. And I, I think, Sabrina, we could probably have another session later to go into more tips and tricks. I don't feel like we really got a chance to cover a whole lot. But any questions? This is Sabrina. I do I do want to mention to everyone that um, Corey will be going into more about Management Reporter at the user groups that are coming up next week. There's one in Bismarck and one in Fargo. So if you want to learn more about Management Reporter, um, it would be great if you would attend those. You can register on our website or else you can shoot me an email and I can register you. Um, the Fargo event is on Wednesday, May 9th, and it's in the afternoon. And the uh, Bismarck event is Thursday, May 10th, again in the afternoon from 1 to 4. And if there's anything that you want to see in those sessions, just email Sabrina and we can include those. Yes, great idea. Corey's always open to having some, some information to provide you guys. We want to know what you want to see. So hope to see some of you there. I know a lot of you are a long distance away, and it is kind of hard to, to attend. But if you are in the Bismarck or Fargo area, please do register for those user groups. So with that, um, if any questions do come up, go ahead and send them out to Sabrina, and she'll get them over to Corey. And we'll make sure that you get a response on that. Sometimes it's hard to think of something offhand. So, All right. With that, we will close our session.